On behalf of the College of Forest Resources, I wish to welcome all of you to the fifth Denman Forestry Issue Series entitled In Support of Washington's Non-Industrial Private Forest Land Owners. We look forward to an exciting and informative program today. The purpose of the Denman Forestry Issue Series is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues. As with all the activities associated with an academic setting, our ultimate goal is to inform and educate our students, faculty, and staff, as well as resource professionals, landowners, and the public. These programs are made possible through the generous support provided by the Denman Endowment. The College of Forest Resources engages in a broad mission focusing on the sustainability of natural and managed environments, including urban and rural landscapes. Sustainability is manifested through programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban environments, and sustainable forest enterprises. Today, we focus on the private forest lands in our state that are managed by Non-Industrial Private Forest Landowners, or NIPF. Issues related to the economic dimensions of sustainability are foremost in the minds of many of these landowners as they face implementation of new forest practices regulations adopted by the Washington State Legislature and signed by Governor Locke in 1999. These new regulations are often referred to as the Forest and Fish Rules because they were enacted to ensure the ecological sustainability of our state's forested, riparian, wetland, and associated resources within a socially sustainable environment. This slide illustrates what we mean by sustainability, where in this little triangular area that I'm pointing to is the zone where full sustainability involving all three metrics is achieved. Sustainability of our environmental and ecological services, as well as our natural resources, is only assured if the economic, ecological, and social metrics are kept in the proper balance. The proper balance across the three metrics of sustainability may differ for different classes of owners. For example, non-industrial private versus public, or non-industrial private versus forest industry. The proper balance will also shift from one landowner to another within the NIPF land ownership category. Sustainability tries to ensure that future generations have the opportunity to enjoy the same products and amenities produced by our forest lands that we now enjoy. This slide illustrates the lack of sustainability as at no point do the three circles interact, except for that little sliver where the pointer is right now. Our college is helping to address these new realities in many ways, one of which being today's discussion involving the management of our non-industrial private forest lands. Finding the proper balance is not an easy task. It has been and continues to be a wrenching transformation for many private forest landowners in Washington State. Large shifts in wealth are occurring as a result of this paradigm shift. A commitment to resolving these issues is paramount, for we believe that the shift towards sustainable management and higher standards of forest stewardship is irreversible and will grow stronger in future years. The new Farm Bill that was signed by President Bush on May 13th contains many new programs of importance to NIPF owners. Some of our speakers today will likely address some of these new programs. I wish to point out just two. The Sustainable Forestry Outreach Initiative is a new initiative under the Renewable Resources Extension Act that is designed to educate landowners regarding the value and benefits of practicing sustainable forestry and the importance of receiving professional forestry advice in achieving those objectives. In repealing the Forestry Incentives Program and the Stewardship Incentive Program, a new program, the Forest Land Enhancement Program, was created. This program will be funded at a level of $20 million per year over the next five years, and the program's goal is to establish a coordinated and cooperative federal, state, and local sustainability pro forestry program for the active management 
and restoration of forest on NIPF forest lands. Institutions of higher education are also asked to play an important role in this new effort. Turning to the importance of our discussion today, we need only look at a few summary statistics for Washington State. First, I wish to point out that about 60% of the state's commercial timber land lies in western Washington and 40% in eastern Washington. These 16.1 million acres cover about 38% of our state's total land area. 44% of this area is publicly owned and 56% privately owned, with NIPF and forest industry owners being about equal in their ownership. If we look at the status of the timber inventory, we see that 53% of the standing timber is publicly owned and 47% privately owned, with the NIPF and forest industry being just about equal in their inventory vo volumes. And lastly, in 1999, public lands contributed only 18% of the statewide harvest, while private lands made up almost 82%. NIPF owners accounted for 39% of the total harvest from only 20% of the commercial timberland area. These few slides begin to help us identify the problems we are here to discuss today. Private timberlands in our state are producing an increasing share of the timber harvest on a shrinking land base while simultaneously being subjected to increasing regulatory pressures to provide a growing array of environmental services, amenity, and other public values. Who are the people that make up the NIPF ownership class and how many of them are there? According to Birch, there are over 90,000 forest landowners in our state. Now, during the program today, some of our speakers may use different estimates of the number of landowners as different measuring criteria are oftentimes used. So just keep that in mind. The demographics of an average NIPF owner are also interesting. The following figures, reported by Blattner and Baumgartner in 2000, reveal that the typical owner is about 57 years old, has been a landowner for 23 years, likely lives in a city of 5,000 or more people, and has a family income in excess of $50,000 per year. Lastly, the typical owner is very likely to be a male Caucasian. The typical owner has holdings that look something like this. The forest area is about 40 acres in size, that's the median value. The property is very likely to be owned by one person who is likely to allow public access and lives on the property. Non-resident owners are likely to live 50 or, four, 50 or more miles from the forest property and about one-fourth of the landowners have a fish-bearing stream on their property. Our program today consists of speakers from government, higher education, and the NIPF sectors. They will discuss the types of technical and educational assistance available to NIPF owners, some outreach and technology transfer programs such as the Rural Technology Initiative and the Small Forest Landowner Office, problems and obstacles encountered by a practicing tree farmer in Washington State, and lastly, an update on the private forest forum. Growing recognition that our non-industrial private forest lands play a significant role in providing a variety of products, environmental services, and public values is the subject of today's discussion. I am sure that we will hear a variety of interesting proposals for changing and improving policies that affect these lands. I wish to thank all of today's speakers, as well as those who helped organize this event. I applaud your contributions because I believe the future of forestry and natural resource management in Washington State lies in promoting the sustainable management of our state's natural resources. With these brief comments, I will turn the podium over to Associate Dean Bob Edmonds, who will introduce the rest of our program. Our first uh, speaker this morning is Steve Gibbs. He is a statewide forest stewardship 
Program Manager with Washington Department of Natural Resources in Olympia. He received his BS in Forestry from the State University of New York in Syracuse and his MS in Forestry at Washington State University. Steve has 26 years experience assisting family forest owners as a field service forester and a forestry extension agent. And this morning he'll talk about public agency assistance for family forest owners. Steve. Well, Dean Bear assured you that this would be both exciting and educational, and I'm, I'm here to prove that that may not necessarily be so. <laughs> Hopefully you'll find it uh, educational, if not exciting. I'd like to talk this morning basically about public agency assistance available to small family forest owners or non-industrial private forest owners, as they've been called in your introduction. I need to preface my remarks with the fact that I'm from the government. We're really here to help you. Really, we are. Honest. Trust me. I think that's the last one. No, I really mean it. <laughs> Let's get into the meat of this. Why would the public sector be interested in assisting small family forest owners? Basically, we're looking to encourage the retention of small family forest lands on the landscape and, for the, and to encourage the uh, management of those lands for their environmental and economic benefits that they provide to society uh, and to the landowner themselves. I'd like to briefly talk about the history of uh, public agency forest landowner assistance in Washington. It date ba dates back over 50 years, uh, primarily a partnership between the USDA Forest Service and state forestry agencies, and this is true in every state, not just only Washington. In the 50s and 60s, our program was called the Farm Forestry Program. In those days, it dealt primarily with farmers and ranchers who held forest land as part of their lands. The emphasis was timber production after World War II. We wanted to make sure we had quality and quantity of timber, production, uh, timber available in the future. And in those days, the DNR had dedicated full-time what we called farm foresters to go out and work one-on-one -on -one with landowners. Then moving into the decades of the 70s and 80s, uh, the DNR restructured and we uh, ended up with uh, a large number of small, uh, excuse me, a, a larger number of part-time service foresters who had many responsibilities, only one of which was to work with landowners. Uh, the timber production remained the emphasis of this assistance program in those days, but it was broadened to non-farm and non-ranch lands as the, the ownership base changed to more non-farmers and non-ranchers. Then in the 1990s and uh, through to today, we have what's called the Forest Stewardship Program. This is an integrated multi-resource program that integrates all of the forest resources on the property. And uh, it appeals to a variety of landowners from all backgrounds, not necessarily agriculture or, uh, or, or uh, timber production backgrounds. And we've now uh, come full cycle and we're back to full-time designated stewardship foresters in most parts of the state where it's 100% of their duty is to deal uh, with small family forest owners. Well, that's the history. What types of assistance are available? Through the Forest Stewardship Program, we're looking at technical assistance, and by that I mean on-site advice where a forester, a wildlife biologist, and or maybe a fish biologist, depending on the type of assistance you require, would actually go out to your land and provide you with on-site individual uh, advice. Educational programs. The NR cooperates closely with other organizations, and you'll hear more about that later in the program. I won't go into this uh, in detail because you'll be hearing from the Extension Service, UWRTI, and others about the educational component uh, of this program. The third component is financial assistance. This is the U.S. Department of Agriculture, <coughs> excuse me, provides uh, cost share funding for forest landowners, which can reimburse them uh, for on-the-ground projects and developing forest stewardship plans, and I'll go into all of this stuff in more detail in a little bit. And then lastly, recognition programs, such as the Stewardship Forest and Backyard Forest Stewardship Program. The, uh, the Backyard Forest Stewardship uh, and Wildfire Safety Program is uh, an off-spin or a spin-off of the, the main forest stewardship program. Our main forest stewardship program is aimed at people that would own, say, five, five acres and up. Uh, however, the Backyard Forest Stewardship Program is a uh, mail-out type of information kit and also available on internet. Uh, with how to do information for people that uh, live in the forest on small acreages, and I'll tell you more about that here in just a little bit. Let's look at each of the types of assistance available. First, we talked about technical assistance. 
This is funded by the USDA Forest Service State and Private Forestry Cooperative Programs and in uh, cooperation with state agencies, in our case it's the Department of Natural Resources. It's the state forestry agency in each state. Approximately 50% of the money is federal money, 50% uh, state. Other agencies uh, that are involved in this to some degree are the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or if you've been around a while you may know them as the old Soil Conservation Service. They also have uh, a handful of foresters that assist landowners. And uh, in some cases uh, we have I think three or four conservation districts in this state who employ forest foresters also. So DNR, NRCS, and conservation districts uh, all provide some, cooperate to provide some type of on the ground individual technical assistance to landowners. What is exactly this type of technical assistance? It basically varies from a one-time walk in the woods visit. If you just want somebody to come out and walk around and answer your questions, uh, we can provide that, a forester, a wildlife biologist, a fish biologist, depending on your needs, there's no charge. If you're interested, we can help you develop a forest stewardship plan and implement that plan. <clears throat> and I'll tell you briefly uh, in a few minutes what's, what's in one of those plans. And then lastly, we provide field service for the USDA cost share programs. If you apply for financial assistance, one of our foresters will go out and help develop the project and then check on it when it's done so that you can receive your payment. The forest stewardship plan. These are the elements that's, that are in a forest stewardship plan. The uh, information about the landowner, the land description, the owner's objectives, which is one of the most important parts. Each of these plans is individually crafted for individual specific landowners. And then we look at all of the forest resources. Timber and wood products, soils, water quality, riparian, fish and wildlife habitat, uh, endangered species, cultural resources, aesthetics, recreation, agroforestry, special forest products, and so forth. And then we wrap it all up with management recommendations and a timetable over a 10-year period. That's technical assistance. Moving on to financial assistance, I'd like just briefly to talk about the US, USDA forestry cost share programs. These have been around a long time and have been uh, through many different iterations and names and we're not right now in, in the uh, transition to a new era under the Farm Bill as Dean Bear alluded to. So by this time next year we'll probably be operating a whole new set of uh, forestry cost share programs. Historically there's been the Forestry Incentives Program or FIP that's been around for about 30 years and is about to be sunsetted. Uh, that program emphasizes timber production. The Stewardship Incentive Program uh, has been around uh, for about 10 years and that's a multi-resource program covering all resources, timber, fish, water, wildlife, etc. That also will be sunsetted and replaced by a new cost share program under the new Farm Bill. And then right now, uh, as part of the National Fire Plan, uh, we, we have a uh, cost share program for wildfire hazard reduction on properties in eastern Washington uh, where people are doing defensible space around homes and buildings creating shaded fuel breaks by thinning and pruning and so forth to uh, better prepare for wildfire. And there are other cost share programs which are primarily aimed at farmers and ranchers uh, but for which land, uh, forest landowners can also apply in some cases. I'm not going to get into them because there's quite a few. Well we've been through technical assistance, financial assistance in general. I'd like to talk about the types of cost share practices that are available through financial assistance. Uh, development of a stewardship plan, afforestation, timber stand improvement or forest stand improvement rather, agroforestry, windbreaks, soil water protection, riparian and wetland, fish and wildlife habitat, forest health and wildlife, uh, wildfire hazard reduction, and aesthetic and recreation improvement. And I anticipate these were all categories that were in the stewardship incentive program or SIP which is being sunsetted and I anticipate most of these categories, if not all of them, uh, will also occur in the new cost share program, the Forest Land Enhancement Program, uh, which is coming with the new Farm Bill. Educational programs. Uh, DNR supports and co-sponsors programs with WSU Cooperative Extension, and you'll hear shortly here from Extension Forester Don Hanley, uh, and others such as the University of Washington Rural Technology Initiative and other agencies and organizations. And you'll hear more about that later in the program. Lastly, the recognition aspect. Those that have a forest stewardship plan are eligible to have their forest uh, recognized as, as a stewardship forest. Uh, we also provide assistance in certifying tree farms. And the backyard forest stewardship recognition uh, is a self-nominated uh, 
program to which you, you return a card certifying that you've done certain links uh, on your acreage and then we mail you out a certificate. Other services DNR provide just briefly, we have a photo and map sales office. You can get aerial photos, topographic maps <clears throat> and the like. Uh, our Webster Forest Nursery has ceilings for sale to landowners and you see the telephone numbers on your screen. And the small forest landowner office, which is something new in DNR and is unique in the United States, and you'll be hearing from Steve Stinson, the manager of that office, here very shortly. I'd like to briefly go through the Backyard Forest Stewardship Program. This program differs from the Forest Stewardship Program, uh, as I mentioned, in that it, it's uh, tailored to small acreages, say people that would own between 10 trees and 10 acres, and specifically anybody that would own a house out in the woods. And the, the primary emphasis in developing this program was for wildfire hazard reduction initially, but we expanded it to include all of the, the topics you see there on the left of your screen. We have an information kit. You can call the toll-free number, 888-STU-KIT, uh, anytime, 24-7, and we'll mail that out to you for free. Or it's available by email at the address you see on your screen. Uh, or directly on the internet, we have an internet version at the address you see on your screen. Where can you find a DNR forester if you want somebody to come out and provide some of this technical assistance? We have seven regions around the state, as you can see, noted on your screen here, and you can contact them, any DNR office, by toll-free at 800-527-3305, and then just follow the prompts on the, uh, on the voice system. Ask for the stewardship forester in the, in the county that's in where your land is located. You can, anywhere in the state, you can email that address, forest underscore stewardship at wadnr.gov, and we'll make a referral to the DNR uh, forester in your area. And in some cases, it may, the referral may go to NRCS Conservation District, uh, or there are people here today from King County. Uh, they also have a forestry program in their county, so we coordinate with all those folks. Uh, if you'd like to mail to us, you can see the address on your screen, P.O. Box 47037 Olympia, and then the websites down below. And I guess that brings us to the end. Our next presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Don Hanley. Don is an extension forester with Washington State University. He lives and works in Western Washington and holds the position of forest, a professor of extension forestry with the University of Washington. Don holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in forestry from the University of Montana, and he received his PhD from the University of Idaho. As a researcher, he's focused on small-scale silvicultural applications for non-industrial private forest parcels. As an educator, he's been conducting landowner education programs and authoring publications on the subject for over 25 years. And this morning, he'll talk about education programs designed for forest landowners. Don. Thank you, uh, Bob, and welcome to the audience here today. It gives me great pleasure to uh, address this issue, uh, educational opportunities for uh, family forest uh, landowners or small forest landowners in the state. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be a, uh, here at the College of Forest Resources, even though I'm a WSU Extension Forester for almost 20 years now. It's amazing how time flies. And uh, this has allowed us to bring uh, the research generated knowledge from the College of Forest Resources out to the people of the state through the land grant system at WSU been an excellent uh, relationship. Uh, we've heard already about the uh, importance of the non-industrial private forest landowner uh, in the state. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the green wedge there or the wedge in the top right corner, uh, about 20 percent, give or take, uh, uh, owned by the small private forest landowners. Uh, this is over three million acres. It depends, 3.1, 3.5, depending on how it's defined, but people don't realize how enormous this is and the uh, Im immense responsibility that these people have to steward public resources. This is primarily the reason why uh, public resources go into helping these landowners, because of the clean water and air and wildlife habitat that they produce. Can you visualize over three million acres? If you stretched it out in a two mile wide swath from Seattle going east along I-90, you would end up in uh, mid-state New York. Uh, it's an enormous acreage. It's something that people just don't, that underestimate when they hear about our state, how many acres there are uh, owned by these people. I put this slide together a number of years ago. Uh, most landowners want to do what's right for the land, 
I, I truly believe that. I said that in 1983, and a person quoted me at a landowner conference and said that was their take-home message. Well, there's a lot of other issues that are on the table today, and, and I really don't think they've changed a great deal. Uh, landowners are very interested in estate planning. They're very interested in regulatory issues, in management planning and implementation. These are the things that we've traditionally focused on, that third point. These are no, in no particular order. Uh, we know there's been insufficient educational and technical assistance opportunities, and hopefully with the new Farm Bill, that will change a little bit as the society, as our society realizes that these lands are incredibly important to our society. Development pressures, loss of markets, fluctuating prices, recreational demands on these properties. There's a lot of issues facing these people today. A few years ago, my colleagues at WSU did a uh, survey and they asked the question, why do these landowners own land? Well, if you look at these categories, you'll quickly see that uh, income from timber is about halfway down the list at about 50% or 48%. What does this mean? This clearly means that the, the ownership objectives oftentimes relate to personal satisfaction or personal reasons why they own that land. Well, we learned from this. We learned that if we got landowners interested in their forest ecosystem, they would then use timber management or other techniques to achieve their personal objectives. Instead of simply telling the landowner, as we did back in the 50s and 60s, because these programs are relatively old, uh, here's what we think you should do. We now listen to the landowner. We get them interested in that ecosystem that they own and we then help them achieve those objectives and quite often that does include timber management. Let's talk a little bit now about the forest stewardship education program that Steve Gibbs alluded to earlier in the program. Back in uh, 1989, after many, many years of doing almost an exclusively timber management program and the WSU Cooperative Extension uh, program for landowners started prior to World War II. But back in 1989, we started thinking about this. We were attracting the same landowners to the, to the classes time and time again, and we weren't reaching out to the bigger group of them. And, and then so we decided that we needed to make this transformation, which we did. We got people interested in their forest ecosystem for whatever that objective was. Uh, back in 1989, we entered into an agreement with the Department of Natural Resources to, to co uh, develop the Forest Stewardship Educational Program. Don't get me wrong, uh, I'm, a, I'm a true uh, silviculturalist by training and I really believe that non-industrial landowners will and need and use silviculture to achieve these objectives. Uh, I can give you many examples of uh, non-commodity objectives of why a person would own a land but then they would use commercial uh, silvicultural techniques to achieve those and there are many, many hundreds of them. I truly believe that silvicultural ignorance leads to rules, regulations, and land conversion, and we've seen that uh, time and time again uh, when landowners uh, get out of the business, if you will, and their land uh, resorts to some other use. We know that if we give these people the best technical information we can and we get them to learn it, they can make decisions today or they can make decisions and know what will happen for some type of future desired uh, uh, stand type that they may have, desired condition, and give them opportunities. They have to think into the future. We also talk a little bit about the landscape approach, which we never did prior to the 1980s. We know that their, their forests are simply an integral part of the larger picture, and those that integration is extremely important to maintain many of the uh, aspects that we, we all desire as a society. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about the educational resources, uh, what's available and what we're doing out there. And again, it's not a complete list, but it it's, it's covers a lot. Four stewardship notes. This is a uh, uh, newsletter that goes out to 16,000 landowners in the state. It doesn't go to everyone but it goes out to quite a few, twice a year. And this is simply a uh, publication that is, provides short educational articles. 
it's not so much a newsletter. It's not so much this is what's happened yesterday and this is what happened at that meeting and so forth. But it clearly is a, a small educational compendium of articles. It always has a calendar of events, of what's happening. It always has some price information in it. And it always has the listing of the DNR foresters, the NRCS foresters, and the, and the WSU foresters that are available and how you can contact them in every issue. This has been very successful. It's actually won two national awards, and uh, we're quite proud of that fact. The, the next leg of the forest stewardship program are our publications. These are our textbooks. These are the textbooks that the landowners use. And they vary everywhere from songbirds to, to timber harvesting. And I put these up because these are three good examples of where faculty in the College of Forest Resources have worked with, uh, with us at WSU to develop these educational programs. Uh, Professor Manuel was involved in the bird one, Professor Oliver in the pruning, and uh, Professor Grulick in the timber harvesting. And there are many other examples of this collaboration. Uh, these publications, uh, they're, they're many in scope, and they are, uh, clearly are our textbooks. The calendar. Clearly a landowner would need to know when an educational event is going to occur before they could attend it. So we put this uh, uh, calendar out. It's in the Forest Stewardship uh, uh, newsletter every year. And this, uh, this addresses classes, tours, and field days, and other typical educational opportunities. If you're a landowner and you really haven't attended one of these in the past, I would really encourage you to do so. The interaction from landowner to landowner is probably better than what you're going to he hear from the instructors in many cases. Uh, the real world experience from those people. One of the uh, really examples, real good examples of a uh, educational program is one that we've done in collaboration with the Department of Natural Resources. This in, in woods event, if you will. Uh, the uh, Forest Landowner Field Days. These are uh, enormous events. We've had hundreds of landowners attend, and they can choose topics of what they uh, would like to hear about and interact with the instructors. And there are many people here today that uh, have participated in these uh, events. The next item I'd like to talk about is probably our most sophisticated uh, curriculum. It's a nine-week course called uh, the Forest Stewardship Co Coached Planning Short Course. We realized a number of years ago that when we, we came to college as, as foresters, we didn't learn everything the first day. So how could we expect uh, small landowners to learn everything they needed on a two-hour program and go home? So we devised this program that allowed uh, the landowners to come to a, it's actually an eight-week program with nine sessions. And the objective of this is to allow them to think about their forest land and develop a coached with coaching a forest management plan or a stewardship plan. We feel that many landowners, because they have to deal with family members and they have to, there's an intergenerational aspect associated with this, if there isn't a good plan where the landowner is going, they're not going to get there. Uh, quite often the, uh, uh, the, the patriarch or the family may have had the plan in the back of, back of their head and they just expected the rest of the family to know what was going on. By doing this, developing this plan that is shared amongst family members. Well, it's coached. That means the landowner writes their own plan. We have found in the past that if a plan was given to a, land, to a landowner, oftentimes it was not implemented if they didn't agree with what was in it. So by allowing the landowner to write their own plan with our coaching, we know it's going to get implemented. We have done dozens of these around the state. And uh, it's been a very, very excellent collaborative effort uh, with the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, we uh, appreciate the fact that the landowners have said they continue to want these. And uh, they've been very, very good. Another really good source of information that pretty much summarizes a lot of what I've said is at the, uh, the Natural Resource Sciences Cooperative Extension WSU website. That's quite a mouthful, but the URL is quite easy, uh, extnrswsu.edu. And this is what the first page looks like. It will bounce up, and then you can go to the newsletter. It's on a PDF format. You can go to a bunch of different links. And basically, everything that I've talked about will be listed here, plus a whole bunch of other activities, uh, some forced health issues, and so forth. 
There's some other good websites as well that I'm sure we'll hear about as, uh, later in the program. Uh, the College of Forest Resources website has very good information on it, what's happening here in the College of Forestry. And particular for small landowners, the, uh, the Rural Technology uh, website is quite extensive and quite good in terms of providing uh, the most cutting edge technical information to these folks and we'll hear a little more about that uh, in a few minutes. In, in summary, I'd like to say that the Forest Stewardship uh, Education Program is sponsored by these organizations. Clearly WSU is involved, the uh, Rural Technology Initiative, the College of Forest Resources is involved, the Department of Natural Resources, the DNR folks are involved and it's underpinned by the uh, Forest Service, uh, state and private forestry. Clearly, these are agencies, organizations working in partnership. I've got some email contacts here, and again, these I'm sure will be up on the screen again uh, later in the program. On the left side is the, uh, are the public entities, the DNR, uh, WSU, and the UW, and the USDA NRCS. But let's don't forget, the partnership also with our private partners, the Farm Forestry Association, the Contract Loggers, the Association of Consulting Foresters, uh, the, the Forest uh, Certified Tree Farm Program, and the Washington Forest Protection Association, other private uh, entities that provide uniqueness to the program. Let me quickly say that if it wasn't for the uh, consultant foresters, for example, uh, many of our educational and technical assistance would go, uh, would go wasted because quite often when landowners implement some of these programs, they do this in context of a commercial timber harvest or some type of stand manipulation. Uh, it's clearly the, the domain of the private consultant that helps them get through that, uh, that uniqueness of doing something that they don't do very often in their li lifetime and they're, and they're concerned about it. I've often told landowners that they have uh, three options if they do some type of silvicultural activity, good, bad, or ugly. And uh, the bad and ugly is not good. And uh, that's what we want them to do is get that good goodness out of it. Do it properly and do it correctly. A lot of the other uh, uh, private entities listed here are also quite important. Uh, the contract loggers have an accredited logger program that allows uh, landowners to select loggers that have made at least a minimal commitment to education and stewardship and we think that's very good as well. If all that went too fast for you, uh, I'll put the big screen up here. Uh, that's me, uh, who I am, my address, uh, my email, and my telephone number. If uh, you want to contact me, this is the way to do it and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions or get you to the correct people. Our next presentation will be given by uh, Bruce Lipke. Bruce is the director of the Rural Technology Initiative for uh, Washington State with an office at the University of Washington uh, College of Forest Resources in Seattle. Bruce holds degrees in electrical engineering operations research, industrial engineering, and the executive MBA from the University of Washington. His research is focused on forest economics, global trade, and environmental policy linkages resources assessment, environmental economic performance of renewable industrial materials, and the rural technology transfer. And he'll give us a presentation on rural technology initiative, technology transfer, and its impacts. Bruce. The rural technology initiative is a very new project. It's a pilot project. Uh, it's experimental in nature. Uh, it was chartered to get better technology used in the field. Uh, our mission statement is sort of a mouthful, but basically it's to get better technology in rural areas for management of forests, for increased product and environmental values in support of local communities. We're trying to work to empower the existing infrastructure, some of the infrastructure that you've already heard about, the DNR and the cooperative extension programs. Why was RTI established? Uh, well, there are some recognized set of problems out there. We have a number of legislatures who have been quite concerned about the growing income disparity between urban and rural communities. They're also aware that many of these are response to policy changes that have occurred in recent years. A number of them are quite aware that there's a tremendous increase in the complexity in forest management from changing regulations 
uh, and they're aware that these policies have been contributing considerably to the income disparity issues. Uh, some are even aware that there are new research findings that are well ahead of the implementation. Uh, while research doesn't have all the answers, there are new developments all of the time, and uh, the rural stakeholders are the real key to this problem setting in the sense that they were asking for, if you've got new technology, you need to get it in the field quicker. Uh, so they asked for a pilot project to see if we couldn't get technology in the field quicker to help them. So what is RTI? Well, we're established by federal grant in January of 2000. We're funded by Congress through the USDA Forest Service Cooperative Forestry Programs. Uh, from the very beginning, we've been a cooperative program between the UW College of Forest Resources and the WSU Department of Natural Resources and their cooperative extension. Uh, most important to this, of course, is that we established a rural advisory board right from the beginning composed of a large uh, group of stakeholders in rural communities, non-industrial private forest landowners, east and west, uh, several tribes, woodworkers, a number of industry associations including Hardwoods Commission, uh, rural uh, or the resource conservation districts and even the economic development districts. And they set the priorities for what we've been working on uh, so that we keep, in, keep tr uh, informed on what the rural needs are. Now what basically do we do? Well we try to apply existing research. We're hoping not to have to reinvent research uh, but that means we're basically tool developers. Uh, we have forest planning tools, GIS support tools, uh, road building tools and, and more. Uh, fundamentally we're in the business of technology transfer. Uh, consulting is a main activity to help get technology in the field quicker. Uh, and one form, of course, is technology training, uh, short courses, if you will, uh, a number of them across the state. Uh, when all else fails, we have to analyze problems and try to develop solutions. And if there do not seem to be a solutions on the table, it does take us back to research and trying to uh, get better solutions. If you look at the tools that we have, uh, our most sophisticated tool is probably the landscape management system. Uh, it was developed over a period of years, uh, uh, heavy development over the last five years, and some of the embryonic parts of it take back almost 10 years now. It's a complete forest growth and management simulation and analysis system. Uh, it integrates a suite of forestry tools and a very user-friendly system. Uh, it essentially includes growth models, stand and landscape visualization, stand treatment programs uh, from which you can derive all sorts of other things like economics, uh, habitat suitability, uh, carbon analysis, and uh, a whole suite of outputs. Uh, if you think about it in a visual sense, we start with inventory data, uh, we collect an enormous amount of data, and then when we simulate forward in time, we keep track of just about everything you can keep track of at the stand level as you simulate out into the future. The program includes visualizations, uh, such as the one Don Hanley showed earlier, where you can keep track of the stand at any time, uh, and both at several different perspectives, but also at the landscape level. It also includes uh, a ton of graphics, if you will, in the output. Uh, this particular uh, chart shows the st structure classes over time that we associate forests, uh, showing how they change as a function of treatments. Uh, and by keeping track of the, the, the distribution of these forests over time, it allows us to better link to the suitability of habitat and other functional measures of the forest. Uh, another program we have is called PEGGER. It's a road construction system. It basically allows you in an arc view or GIS framework to see where you are in the terrain and say I'd like to go in this direction and it'll help you figure out the best pathway to get moving in that direction as a function of the grade that you want to allow. So it allows for a quick analysis of alternative road designs uh, we're working on an extension to this, uh, an additional tool, a culvert layout so that we can better uh, 
uh, map and understand the, the water flow associated with the culverts that go with uh, road systems. Our training opportunities have been frequent and many. The last one was in OMAC just a few weeks ago where we covered the landscape management system. Uh, in June we have a GPS uh, short course in LMS in October. Uh, we start over with a sequence of LMS programs and again we have ArcView in October. Uh, we spend an awful lot of time on case studies. Our Rural Advisory Board has told us that you don't really understand the problem unless you've really looked at the details. You can't do it by some simple statistics. So our approach has generally been to get in and look at individual case studies. We've done a number of case studies on the forest and fish rules on the west side of Washington and the east side of Washington. We basically analyze the impacts on the landowner from the changing regulations. Uh, we look at the comparison of management options that are allowed under the new rules. Uh, we look at the assessment of the forest repair and easement program. Well, what is that? Well, the legislature was well aware that some owners would be substantially Im be impacted by the rules. So they included the opportunity for the owner to participate in a forest repair and easement program by uh, taking an easement for 50 years on the trees that they would not be able to harvest and receive some compensation for them. And last but not least, uh, in many cases we find that the rules are still very harsh and are not necessarily the best for habitat. So there are opportunities allowed for under the rules for alternative plans and we're still in the process of determining what makes good alternative plans. I'll show you our first case study here. Uh, this was an owner that had 33 acres. Uh, if you look in the center of this, you can see this line that was in fact the stream. And what these lines on the outside of that stream are is various riparian buffer zones. The first zone being a no-touch buffer, the next two allowing different levels of treatment within that zone out to this outer zone where in the outer zone you have to leave about 20 trees per acre. Well, as you can see, this particular owner has lost 64% in buffers, and not only that, the areas that are left for him to harvest, some of them are slivers that may in fact not be economic to operate anymore. Uh, so this is a pretty substantial change in, the, in the, the way this owner is going to be able to look at the world. What we did essentially is to understand the economics associated with a number of case studies like this. That may look severe. We know we have many owners that have no impact. We have owners that are essentially 100% in a repairing zone. For this particular owner, there were four obvious alternatives uh, that we looked at under the rules before you consider alternative plans. The one that most small owners adopt is the one that says uh, no riparian harvest. That is, the easiest thing for an owner to do is to just say, here's the edge of the riparian zone, I'm not going to do anything in there, because if I do, I'm going to have to get a consultant, I'm going to have to do a lot of layout, uh, I'm going to have to manage a logger to do some specific things. We have three bars shown here for the economic analysis. This first one is the land value. That's the bare land value uh, for the owner. That's the motive to stay in forestry. Uh, if in fact uh, there is no motive to stay in forestry, we're very concerned about increased conversions to other uses of these lands. The second bar is the forest value or the, the value returned to both the timber and the land. And the third one is the forest value if the owner, in fact, participates in the forest repair and easement program and gets compensated for the timber that he leaves behind. As you can see, each of these cases we're comparing to the pre-regulatory situation, which was essentially 25-foot buffers on most of these streams, uh, or at least the fish-bearing streams. The other option that they have, of course, that's still fairly easy, is to harvest only in the outer zone uh, where the rule is pretty simple, you have to leave 20 trees per acre. Uh, once you get to the uh, doing some thinning treatments in the inner zones, uh, many of us would actually want to encourage this because it's, it improves habitat, generally speaking. Uh, option one is to thin these stands in the inner zones and you can see that by doing this and by also at the same time entering the forest repair and easement program, you could get the losses down to about 16% for these owners. However, the losses on the bare land side still look enormous. 
uh, a very serious motivation to say whether you would really want to stay in forestry over the long term. Uh, option two was a somewhat simpler option. Rather than to thin, basically you group the trees on the inner zone uh, up to the point that you had a certain density of trees close to the stream. And in this particular case, this owner could get down to about a 12% loss uh, under these programs. Now, we took these first 10 case studies we did on the west side and we estimated by you know, scaling up the number of riparian acres that we covered, and this is a crude estimate, but it was about a $1.4 billion cost to the non-industrial private foresters without the forest repair and easement program. If you put that on an annual basis, the total west side eligibility for compensation would be something like $26 million per year. Uh, the legislature so far has funded one, uh, something uh, close to about $1.9 million per year, and I think we all know how difficult the situation is for the legislature in the sense of the deficit at the present time. So to start off with, it doesn't look like the program is anywhere nearly adequately funded. So that from that standpoint, we can expect large losses to the small owners. The second fact is, however, that many of them are so uh, negative towards the whole idea of entering a 50-year covenant with the government that many of them would not uh, apply for this program. So we have the mix of it's underfunded, many of them still will not uh, probably want to sign up for this program. Uh, so we've been very interested in trying to look for better solutions. And the direction for better solutions really leads us to alternative plans. But if you're going to develop an alternative plan, you have to be able to show that the repair and protection that you're offering is at least as good as what was being offered under the regulations. So that makes our modeling task a bit more difficult uh, it means that we have to be able to model habitat suitability and measure repairing functions. And one of the problems we have with uh, the nature of science is when you talk to fish biologists, well, they want temperature. Well, landowners don't control temperature in streams. What they control is shade. So first we have to model shade and to be able to show what influence it has. So we're basically looking to develop alternative plans with better habitat and economics. Uh, if you look at our, some habitat indicators, uh, for any given species we can develop a habitat suitability indicator that tracks with our for landscape management system the change in forest structure and what it does to habitat. In this particular case, you can see that even if you do nothing, just by aging the stands, some habitat will be going up and others will be going down. Um, in this case, the Cooper's Hawk goes up quite a bit, comes down quite a bit, uh, and as do the others change. More importantly is to understand the impact of if we manage the lands differently, what does it do? In this case, as I mentioned before, option one is the thinning option, and lo and behold, option one looks quite a bit better than the other options in managing these lands. Of course, it is also one of the higher cost solutions. Uh, in fact, if you look at almost any habitat, uh, uh, our biologist has uh, gone through many of these cases and almost any of the habitat are improved by these thinning options. Uh, when it comes to shade and temperature, uh, we essentially have north buffers and south buffers on the typical east-west stream. You see here the sun comes up in the morning from the east and you get a burst of sun as the sun goes essentially over the angle of the stream. Uh, during the day, these buffers shade the stream, and in the evening, again, you get another little burst of sun. Uh, well, if you cut the buffers out, of course, you'll see the sun hitting the stream most of the day. But the reality is we can do quite a bit better than that. We can control by thinning and where we place the buffers, the kind of effects we get. In particular, you'll notice that the north buffer really has almost no impact in the part of the day that we're interested in since we cut the north buffer out and we only get sun a little earlier in the morning and a little later in the evening on this particular stream, which is of no real consequence to temperature. So we can do temperature, uh, we can do shade modeling, which of course is the driver for temperature, uh, and we can do our treatments in ways that we know what kind of effect we're having. Uh, the second most important factor usually uh, considered for streams is the recruitment of large woody debris into the stream. Well, we can essentially develop uh, the models of how those buffers 
uh, can potentially uh, fall and create recruitment to the extreme. Uh, this line up here shows the expected volume. Uh, the other line here shows the recruitment of pieces into the stream. And if the buffer is limited at some particular point, and we have actually lowered the potential for recruitment, uh, the one of the easiest things that a landowner can do, uh, if there's any incentive to do it, is to add recruitment because you can mechanically create any amount of recruitment that you want. The real issue for owners is to grow bigger trees because the nature of the recruitment that the biologists want is bigger trees over the long run. So in developing alternative plans, uh, the, the, the intent of the regulations are to achieve what we've called desired future conditions. What that really means is to restore some of the functionality of older forests uh, and to do it as soon as we can. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, the regulations often, well, first of all, in many cases you can't thin. You're not allowed to thin in the inner zone. Secondly, the motivation for thinning is gone because the economics for thinning would have required some removal of wood at some future point in time, and so that economics is now gone. So thinning overly dense riparian stands is one of the things that you can do to get on a faster path to the desired future condition. Uh, and we find that is almost always going to be one element of an alternative plan. Uh, on the east side, the issues are quite different. Uh, the fire risks are quite different. The health problems are quite different, but even so, the regulations typically prevent you from doing the kind of restoration for the overstory of pine that was the natural or the desired future condition. Now, in order to make alternative plans work, there's got to be some reduced economic impacts, uh, and that really becomes the hard part is to be able to build the incentives for people to be able to operate with plans that are actually better for the habitat and better for the landowner than, than might not be allowed by the regulations. The challenges are both because it's very difficult to get an alternative plan. We hope to get it to the point where we can have templates that make it a lot easier for people to be able to get alternative plans. The second problem is at the moment is that alternative plans really weren't designed with the guarantee in mind that you may not, in fact, get your economic return until later in time. So the fact that they're typically designed for a five-year period is really not sufficient to provide uh, enough motivation for the owner to, to do it, a development of an alternative plan. Now, so far I've only talked about what we've been trying to do in the buffer zone area. Stream crossing and road upgrades is another major aspect of the forest and fish rules. Uh, another crude estimate uh, for the cost for these for non-industrial private foresters, something like $375 million. And these pro road improvements are supposed to be done in the first 15 years, which amounts to $25 million a year. So this be has become a very difficult part of the uh, process, and we hope with our case studies that we'll be able to figure out how to build them into the alternative planning process to make them a little bit more easy to get uh, improvements accomplished. So in summary, our overall goal is to help rural communities deal with these increasing constraints and complexities. Uh, we're basically trying to provide technical support for improving policies that impact rural communities. We can identify a number of places where the policies have already been essentially improved as a consequence of the information we've provided. Uh, our ruraltech.org uh, website it's got information on a number of projects. All the case study information is up there already. Uh, there's free software downloads for the landscape management system. We are also available on a telephone, and we also have the email. The email is just rti at u.washington.edu. And I think that's a pretty good snapshot of what we're trying to do, and we've got a long way to go.